Good morning, friends. God bless you and happy Saturday morning to you. I've got my cup of coffee and I've been looking forward to having a couple of moments with you at the beginning of what proves to be a wonderful weekend of worship and leadership in the local church. It is my prayer that God blesses you richly and mightily this weekend as you lead in his church and as you equip the saints for the week of opportunity that is just ahead of them. We've been talking about leading in a time of spiritual conflict. And to me, there's little doubt that the presence of spiritual conflict is becoming more and more obvious. As we enter into and lead through this time of spiritual conflict, it's important that we take some time to remind ourselves of some of the very key principles of leading spiritual conflict. And anytime we lead spiritual conflict, the job number one is self-maintenance. Job number one is making sure that I am prepared for what I'm leading into so that those who are following me can be led in a healthy manner. Now, when we talk about spiritual conflict, <laughs> it's super important that we set a good baseline because this is one of those subjects that has uh, the ability to get messy and confusing and sometimes even a little weird and divisive if we're not super careful. So let's set a biblical baseline as we have each week in this series. First of all, we, we have agreed on our previous two teachings that spiritual conflict is a reality that we are equipped for the fight spiritually. God's taking good care of us with armor and instruction in his word about how to handle this part of our leadership. And it's good to remember that the Lord is fully engaged in the battle with us and for us. And we should expect to be victorious when it comes to spiritual conflict. Now, all of that uh, coupled with Ephesians chapter 10 uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, tells us some super important concepts. First of all, in that scripture, we find out and we're reminded that the devil has schemes. It's referred to as our struggle and that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers in the dark realm. Armor is needed for the intensity of this battle and the goal at the end of the battle is that after having done all, you would still be standing and those around you would be standing and those in your congregation would be standing and those in the community that your church reaches would be standing. So in this study, we're looking at the methods, the schemes of the devil, and we're talking about some of those things that are identified in scripture as schemes of the enemy. Last week, we talked about how our thought life is a battlefield. And in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, it says we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We talked about doubt. We talked about temptation and accusation and the relationship between those two things. And we talked about discouragement. Today, I want to talk about another one of the devil's schemes. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2.10, the second part, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Pastor, leader, missionary, my friend, my brother, my sister, it is so important that we remain aware of the fact that we are in spiritual conflict and that the devil has schemes and that we be aware of the fact that he has schemes. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Verse 11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. I want to talk to you today a little bit about unforgiveness. Knowing and understanding forgiveness, preaching forgiveness, and then failing to extend forgiveness. Boy, uh, unforgiveness in leadership is a dangerous thing. And unforgiveness in leadership is one of those things that can provide an absolute playground for the devil in our own personal lives, in our own personal relationship with Christ, and definitely in our leadership. If we are to forgive one another, 
we, uh, we need to understand that that has a link even to how we receive forgiveness. Now, Matthew 6, 15, 14 and 15 says this, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men in their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. If. For if you forgive. That means that forgiveness is a choice. It means that you get to choose when it comes to forgiving others. But there is a consequence. If you do not, then there's some other things that are going to happen. The choice is yours. The consequences are not yours to choose. They're handed out by God himself. In days of challenge and varied opinion and a multitude of approach, there's an increased opportunity for ministers to become offended or hurt or insulted. People hurt us as we minister. Some people hurt us quite intentionally and some people unintentionally. But the result is the same. We get hurt. Forgiveness becomes a huge aspect of effective living and leading the church in a time of spiritual conflict. Now let me define a couple of terms for you. The word anger. This is a strong feeling of intense displeasure, hostility, or indignation as a result of a real or imagined threat, insult, frustration, or inward in, uh, or injustice toward yourself or somebody important to you. Anger. There's nothing wrong with being angry. Anger is not a sin. The Bible tells us that in our anger, just don't let it lead to sin. Then there's unforgiveness. And this is a deliberate, willful refusal to give up one's resentment and the right to get even based on the wrongful thought that somebody needs to pay for what they've done to you. And then there's forgiveness. Forgiveness is defined this way for this study. Giving up resentment against somebody and your right to get even with them no matter what's been done. It is the surrender of my right to do hurt back to you. Please notice in Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. The word us here is an interesting word. That points to a collective nature of the prayer that Jesus is teaching his disciples. It encompasses all believers, not just me, not just you, not just those in my section, not just those I get along with, not just those in the body of the assemblies of God. It's a community in this verse that's bigger than all of that. We're all in the same boat. We all need forgiveness. The word us is significant. It's not just me, mine, or I. It's us. And please remember that forgiveness is not forgetting. It says this in Hebrews 10, 17. Then he adds, their sin and lawlessness, lawless acts, I will remember no more. Now, a lot of people think they haven't forgiven well if they haven't forgotten the event. Even God remembers the sins. He just remembers it against you no more. So forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is not always easy. Forgiveness is not letting the other person off the hook. Romans 12, 19 says this, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. You let God deal with the injustices. You let God deal with the wrong. You let God deal with all those conversations and all those Facebook posts and all that nonsense that gets said about you. You let God deal with that. You take it off of your plate and put it onto God's plate. God has good record and he will repay. He'll take care of it. What forgiveness is, is an act of the will. And it's for your benefit. And it's something, my brother, my sister, that we are commanded to do. Forgiveness is not an issue between you and another person. Forgiveness is always between you and God. Forgiveness is an act of obedience between me and God. Forgiveness has nothing to do with you and me. 
On my side, it has to do with my obedience to God and my adherence to scriptural principle. And that's why I forgive you because of my obedience and adherence to God's principles and his nature. It says this in John 17, 11, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I want to tell you again that we are leading in times of spiritual conflict. And one of the things that I have noticed in an uptick is conflict between ministers, hurt feelings between ministers, statements being made between ministers that has created hard feelings and it's been done on such a platform that congregants are aware and spouses are aware and friends are aware and wrongs suffered need a quick response not of anger not of revenge not of my right to get even but of forgiveness let's forgive quickly let's forgive as christ jesus forgave us and let's extend forgiveness, especially to those that are ministers and are doing their very best to lead their churches through difficult days so that we are unified, so that we are one, even as Jesus and the Father are one, and so that we don't give a playground for the devil because we are not unaware of his schemes. God bless you, friends. Have a great weekend. Lead them well. I love you, and I am honored to be standing with you during this time in history. God bless you.